My name is Carolyn Canfield, and I call myself a citizen patient. I'm independent. I also hold a honorary lectureship as a faculty member in the Department of Family Practice at the University of British Columbia Faculty of Medicine. And I am the proud holder of uh, the inaugural Canada Patient Safety Champion. It's a complicated question, and I think it's absolutely individual. Uh, I think that there are challenges in talking to anyone uh, in healthcare that shakes their confidence in their care. So the way in which patients learn about errors in their care can be, uh, can be problematic. I also think it's essential that patients and families understand about the quality of their care and they understand when an error has been made. So I would say it's about trust, it's about building trust, and part of building trust is having complete confidence in the quality of your care. When there has been an error, and if you don't know, the sense of betrayal can be more devastating than the physical impacts. I, I think that patients do need to know about the, the sea of hazard surrounding their care, and I think in the case of near misses, uh, it's just as important as when there has been physical harm because, as I say, it really has to do with trust. It has to do with building relationships of trust. Um, I do have some knowledge of systems where parents of uh, pediatric patients have been told about near misses or have been told about uh, actual incidents of, of uh, error. And their response is, thank you for telling me. I have more confidence in the system because of the candor because of the disclosure, because of the, the concern that you have about my child's care. So in fact, trust can be strengthened by the disclosure of error, which, which I find fascinating and, and you know, to know that this actually happens. It's brilliant. Well, I think that the conversation actually happens much earlier. And I do understand that the public often has misconceptions about patient safety, about the security of, of their condition, uh, the predictability of care, the predictability of their treatment plan. So I think really early on the conversation about um, expectations is really important. It's part of the, the informed consent to any kind of intervention. Now I know in emergency medicine and there are other kinds of situations where it's impossible to do that sort of early conversation, but I think where it is possible it's really essential to talk about uncertainty, to talk about the uncertainty of a person's physical condition, the way in which that may change through an episode of care, and then the uncertainty around treatment itself so that the informed decision about the care plan includes an understanding of uncertainty. So when there is an error, when there is um, a failure in care, because the word error to me is problematic. I, I think that you know it's really broader. It's about failures in care where the expected outcome isn't uh, doesn't happen. There's something unexpected that occurs. We can have uh, adverse events that are possible uh, that that are expected, if you like. They're, they're if a surgery does not result in, as we would wish, that's not necessarily an adverse event. Okay, so um, but that but for a patient, that's something that that the patient needs to know, and it can be a surprise and just as difficult as uh, as an error in care. Um, so the harm that comes from an unexpected outcome uh, can be just as devastating. So uh, so going back to to your question about what. What do, what do I want to know? Um, I want to know everything, actually. I want to be informed that there has been a failure in care. I want to have an explanation, and I understand if I'm told that we don't know exactly how this occurred. But eventually, I want that explanation to be shared with me. I want to know as much as I, as I can early on, um, sensitive to who I am. I want you to know about my values and preferences. I want you to know about my robustness emotionally. Um, what's at stake? I want you to know about my cognitive abilities because I may not be able to understand what you're saying for all kinds of reasons. It may be language and it may also be my, my mental condition, my emotional condition, my physical condition. So I do want to know, but that's what I'm telling you now by Carolyn Canfield this moment. Um, 
in, in the process of being cared for, that may change. Uh, I'd like the conversation to start out early for understanding what my, my uh, abilities are and my interests are. I want to be asked if something goes wrong, how, um, you know, how much do you want to know? Uh, would you like your family members to know? Uh, would you like this to be your family members understanding what happens first and then they can share it with you? So I'd, I'd like to have this as in context with my network of trust. Um, but, but if you ask me today, I want to know what happened, why it happened. I also want to receive an apology. And uh, from my own experiences in healthcare, I have a much stronger sense of how important that is. To be able to hear, hear the words, I'm sorry, uh, is, is profoundly impactful. Now, where I live, there's an Apology Act that actually enables healthcare professionals to express regret without incurring liability. And that legislation in British Columbia has spread to most of the provinces in Canada. So that provides a legal insurance that the healthcare professional is not getting themselves into uh, a, a situation of liability inappropriately before there's been a full investigation, for example, uh, to see if there is any liability there. So uh, that apology is very important in terms of restoring trust because that's actually the objective of all of this. The reason we're doing disclosure is to reestablish a relationship of trust between healthcare and the patient, the recipient of care, and their network in the community, the wider public confidence in healthcare. So the other, the other thing that I really want to know, and, and perhaps this is the first thing I want to know, is am I safe? If something has happened, am I safe? Have I, is my condition stabilized? Or am I continuing at risk? And if so, what are you going to do to support it? It may be that I need emotional support because of the nature of the impact on me personally. It's, it, it's, it's very much about who I am and my sense of vulnerability. So I'd like ongoing support. And if a week from today I need support, I would like that to be available. And I think the overall learning we have about adverse events and disclosure uh, and the duty of candor, is that what patients and families want, if there has been physical harm, uh, if there's been an impact on a person's quality of life because of that failure in care, is that we really want to know this isn't going to happen to anyone else. So receiving an undertaking to remedy whatever it is that has been the trajectory uh, to the harm that I've experienced is, is very important. It's extremely satisfying for some patients to actually participate in creating those remedies. So an invitation, I, I think this is something that, that our healthcare systems really need to recognize as an asset, an invitation to the, the victim, if you like, uh, who may be family members as well as the, the, the patient in the case of harm, uh, an invitation to participate in a remedy, whether it's through teaching or whether it's through recommending a different course of care to have other elements added, uh, it can be a very powerful healing, not only for the patient, but also for the participants in the care of it, in the failure of care. Um, closure is something that's difficult for the second victims, for those healthcare professionals who have participated in a failure in care. Their sense of isolation and blame and um, uh, deep regret that they may not be able to express to their team members or to the victims uh, can be devastating. And we have lots of examples of, of uh, that harm changing the course of someone's profession or even a professional taking their own life because of the, the suffering they experience having participated in harming a patient, which is, of course, something that they never intended. So involving those second victims in finding a remedy, uh, ensuring that no other patients experience this, and working with the victims can be very healing. It certainly isn't a plug and play. It's not something that all patients and all um, providers can participate in successfully, but on an individual basis to see if there is a way of finding closure through that uh, can, be, uh, can be incredibly healing. Well, I, I have a sense of it. Um, what do I think about it? I, I think it's, it, it may be a clumsy tool to guide what has to be an individually crafted relationship-based recovery of trust. 
and and I think that's the challenge is it really this is about being sensitive to who a patient is, who their family is, how they relate to healthcare. Um, I think, unfortunately, in my system as well as in NHS England, we address the, the the way in which we need to respond to harm way too late in the process. We really have to start being very cognizant of those relationships of trust and building trust early on, and also understanding the uncertainties of medicine. Uh, the public oftentimes has a feeling, and I certainly have in my life, had a feeling that putting myself in the hands of the medical community is the safest place I could be. In fact, I know now that simply being admitted to hospital introduces hazards to my well-being. I had no idea. Uh, this, when I first heard the, the phrase patient safety, I was astonished. What? A patient isn't safe? How could this be? So I think that, that understanding um, that medicine is not a silver bullet, that it, everything isn't certain, that we really are in a collaboration to create an improvement in function, uh, to cure an ailment, to um, repair damage. That this is a collaboration. This is a collaboration between healthcare professionals and patients and their families in their community context. And in order to do that, we need to accept the, the possibility that um, there's risk. There's risk surrounding everything that we do, greater or lesser. And to submit ourselves to care is accepting risk and embracing risk, em embracing the possibility that there will be outcomes that we don't anticipate. I've, when I first heard it, um, I thought, right, it's, it's doing things in the interest of the patient. And the more I began to explore that, uh, it seemed to me that very often patient-centered care is healthcare professionals imagining what is in the patient's interest. So it really involves asking patients what they need and what they want. And the way I guess I've begun to see it far more it's really about building trust relationships so that the communication between patients and healthcare professionals is seamless, it's easy, it flows. Um, it's, it's progressive and it requires enormous sensitivity and skills. And I think that's where, uh, that's where patient-centered care really is. Um, I think that you know, we've gone from a hierarchical model of healthcare where the best patient was the compliant patient, the patient who followed uh, the authority of the healthcare professional. We're now in a shared decision-making space where it's about informing a patient of alternative paths of care and uh, in ensuring that the patient understands what the evidence is, what the experience is, and for a patient like me, what's the most likely uh, good outcome. I then introduce my own values and preferences into that decision, and I make the decision with that evidence base. Uh, collaboratively with the uh, with the healthcare professional, but I think we are moving towards an uh, even more patient-directed care model. So we'll no longer be talking about patient-centered care. We'll be talking about patient-directed care, and I think that that really presumes that we'll have better informed patients, which they're doing themselves. I mean, that's the reality of the of of the internet and access to the experience of other patients through electronic means, building communities of patients that are really outside of the formal healthcare system. So we have better informed patients arriving, having to, uh, the opportunity to have conversations with healthcare professionals that fine tunes their knowledge to the particular setting and the care that is available, and then directing their care through the, that, that uh, uh, menu of resources that are available. So I think when we talk about patient-centered care, it's really all of us beginning to get oriented around the authority and, and the rights of patients to be able to choose the care that's best for them.